All right, ladies and gentlemen, friendly reminder, you only have two assignments going in for the rest of this quarter. On Monday, you'll be turning in a do now. It'll be worth 12 points. The do now has three days on it. Four times three is 12. You and I can do that math. And then you also have your review packet. I am sitting in eighth period. Eighth period, your review packet is due at 8.30 a.m. on Friday, December 20th. No excuses. I was playing with Edsby this morning. Your scores will increase by three and a half whole percentage points by turning in this review packet, which is a huge deal for some of you because you're on the cusp of another letter on your grade. So that's a big deal. Someone then asked me, like, how much points do you lose if you get a zero? I didn't look at that because I'm trying to be a positive person. And you know how hard that is for me. And I also didn't care because if it was a zero, it doesn't affect me anyway because it's just going in. So what I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, turn in your damn packets. We're going to finish it today in class, hell or high water. Um, and you get your 150 points. If you do not complete everything, you're going to get blood of points. And if you don't turn it in, you're going to get hemorrhaging points. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are some times you're going to have to be a grown-up. Friday, December 20th at 8.30 a.m., you need to be that grown-up with your review packet in hand. Is everyone clear? Okay. So, if you forget it and your mama, your papa, whoever loves you calls me and is like, oh my god, my kid is so upset, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to refer them to the nine videos where they'll hear me clearly saying every day, I will accept no late packets. Is everyone clear? Okay. Uh, there's something else. Oh, this weekend, what I would do is I would kind of go through your packet. I'm saying spend 20 or 30 minutes. Like, let's not hurt ourselves. 20, 30 minutes, and I would highlight the things that you are just kind of questioning. That you're like, yeah, this isn't super smooth for me. Does that make sense? 20, 30 minutes, let's not go crazy. On Monday, we're only doing whiteboards in class. What I would do is, I'm obviously going to record my lecture and post it on Monday. What I would do Thursday night and maybe even Friday morning, I would listen to that lecture again while I'm going over board questions. Does that make sense? With your test on Friday, ladies and gentlemen, you do need to study for my exam. Like, that's a pretty big gap. AP Psych's content is not hard. Can we agree? Makes logical sense. However, there just happens to be a lot of it. And especially with a big de uh, I won't see you from Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you need to study for my exam. The best way to do it would be listen to my videos, listen to the boards, probably try to do the boards at home kind of thing, write down the answers as you're going, just like you do in class, to see if you can come up with the answers as fast as the best way to practice. Can we agree? Can we all agree that you've learned a lot because I use boards in this classroom, right? That repetitiveness, that drill and kill kind of thing. So that's what I would do. You need to take this exam seriously for the mere fact I'm not seeing you till Friday. If you were taking me first thing Tuesday morning, I would tell you not, you don't need to study as hard. Can we agree? But because you're later in the week, you're going to have to do a little bit more studying. That makes logical sense. Can we agree? All right, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the part of your brain that holds your long-term memories? Good. What do we got? Uh, Diana. Hippocampus. Hippocampus. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is located just above your medulla in the center, central part of your brain. It is used to move information from the brainstem to its correct lobe. Thalamus, hypothalamus, amygdala. What is it, Carolee? On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the ability to think about a problem and come up with multiple solutions for it? This comes, this varies from person to person, but can be improved with practice and opportunities. Grace, Creativity. on your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when your sensations are overwhelmed with multiple smells, sights, and experiences that our brain cannot process and eventually stops relaying information to our brain? What is it? Hampton. On your whiteboard, what is it called? 
It is located on the top back part of your brain. It holds your somatosensory cortex and motor cortex. Actually, your motor cortex is in your frontal lobe. That's another thing. This lobe uh, processes all of your body's sensations. Rex, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the dude who created the law of effect. Good. Zoe, Thorndike. Thorndike, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is, uh, this is a drug that hits our brain in the pleasure cortex and in our peripheral nervous system. This drug makes people uh, feel invincible, super intense with their emotions and sensations. What is it, Nathan? Or ecstasy. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of uh, a, school of a school of psychology that emphasizes factors of self-image and self-actualization. Oh, I messed that up. Bernstein. Humanistic. Humanistic. On your whiteboard, please tell me. It is a mutual relationship or connection between two or more things. It doesn't necessarily happen because of each other, but they typically go along with each other. What is that? Maggie, what is it called when the action of one causes the action of another? If I punch Rex in the face, then he will start bleeding. That is called what, Grace Mary? Causation. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is, uh, um, let's go to the packet, because I want these done. Okay, so, I have told you once, I've told you a million times, I am a moron. And I have like six packets going. So none of my packets, even after I finish this class, Grace, will be done, because I'm an idiot, and that's just who I am as a person. So I'm going to need your help to figure out what boxes you actually need. Is that fair? So we left off at confirmation bias. Is that correct? Okay. So we finished it. Perfect. So confirmation bias is when you only accept information but agrees with your thought process. If you hate Trump, you only believe bad things. If you love Trump, then you believe only the good news. Hindsight bias is where we're picking up, ladies and gentlemen. Hindsight bias is when... You look back, and I'm capitalizing back and underlining, back on something, and over, and I'm writing that in capital caps, overestimate how much you knew something was going to occur. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a perfect example is in 2016 when Donald Trump won the election. I don't care if you love him, hate him, that's not the point of the story. I think we can all agree the whole nation was pretty surprised that he won, yes? Because the polls had him losing by a lot, and here we are with Donald Trump as our president. So, if you talk to people today, they'll be like, I knew from the moment he came down the escalator that Donald Trump was going to win. No, you didn't. There was like 25 other Republicans in the mess at that point. So hindsight bias is when people look back and say, oh, I totally knew that was going to happen. I hate those people. Nope. At the very bottom, you're writing ethical standards. Debriefing. Confidentiality. Informed consent. and protection, both physical and mental. So you need to make sure that you don't abuse those things. What? Are you okay? Okay. Um, I have an open spot that we abandoned on, uh, for which one? Visual Cliff, right? Okay, for Visual Cliff, go back to that one. Let's fill it in right now. On the first page? No, it's underneath your, stand, uh, your standard deviations. Okay, so your visual cliff was empty. We're going to cross it off, and you're going to write independent variable on top. 
and underneath you're going to write dependent variable. Okay, so for independent variable, it is what the experimenter is manipulating. I'm going to underline manipulating. It's under the control of the experimenter. Okay, so when I first started teaching you research, which is what category this is, uh, research, I used the experiment of wondering if you guys would steal candy from me, correct? So I told you I'd put a uh, bowl of candy in the front of the room to see how many of you would steal from me. So what is the independent variable in that experiment? The candy, because if the candy's not there, can you do the experiment? No. And who puts the candy there? Me. So, independent variable is what the manipulator is testing, what the manipulator is putting in. Dependent variable is how the subject reacts to the independent variable. And I'm going to write nice and big, it's the behavior. So, a dependent variable is how they react to the independent variable. So, what is the dependent variable in the experiment where I'm trying to see if you will steal candy from me? <coughs> Stealing candy from me. The actual action, are you going to take it? Because some of you will take it, correct? If I had a bowl of candy sitting right there, you'd be like, well, it's conveniently located next to the boards and we're supposed to take boards. It's not usually there. So you would be like, yeah, and you would steal it. Now, so, dependent is how you respond. Everyone good? So, just to make sure, because I need your help. First page is totally done, yes? Second page is totally done. Third page is totally done. Fourth page is done. Fifth page. We're done? No, fourth page we're done, and then now we're on the fifth page. The back. We're on the back. Okay. We have nothing on the back? Okay, we can fill that in now. Here we go. Misinformation effect, we're crossing off. Okay, you have manifest content up top. Then we're going to have latent content uh, below. Okay, manifest content is the actual plot line of a dream. So I had a bear chasing me. So if they ask me what the manifest uh, content of my dream is, a bear chasing me. Perfect. Latent content is the symbolic meaning, symbolic meaning of a dream. And the bear represents my mother. She's terrifying. Okay, kinesthetic is a person's awareness of the position and movement of their body in space. People with high, and I'm going to write high in caps, kinesthetic, uh, ballet dancers, and baseball players. Are two good examples. Debriefing, post-experiment, Participants get to learn the ins and outs slash outcomes of the experiment. Typically, interview.
slash survey. Placebo effect. They are used in uh, double blind. drug studies to see to, I'm sorry, I don't want to say, to compare the success of the drug to they're used to see the success of the drug. Sorry, I didn't like the way I explained it last period, so I'm changing it on the fly. They're used in double blind, a double blind drug studies to compare it uh, to compare the success of the drug. Okay, placebo effect is the belief that the person receiving the placebo has greatly improved because of the specific drug. They aren't taking it. They're taking a drug which equals mental mental changes. So placebo effect is the fact that you believe something has occurred when in fact it hasn't occurred. Maintenance rehearsal is the process of memorizing info for the, and I'm capitalizing S-H-O-R-T, the short term, about 20 seconds. Example, telephone numbers. When someone gives you a phone number, what do you say over and over again until you type it in your phone? The number, people's names that you just met. And of course, vocab quizzes. You know how when I tell you to put all away all of your stuff and all of you are sitting there like, <laughs> waiting for the quiz to begin? Vocab quizzes. Elaborative rehearsal is the process of memorizing info for your capital letters long-term memory. Example, lyrics to a song you sang a thousand times tying new info to previous info. Okay, get rid of context. We're going to write proactive interference. Interference. Past memories. Prevents, and I'm going to capitalize it and underline it. Prevents the recall of new, underline and capitalized, memories. Example, you learned, you mislearned, I'm so sorry, you mislearned a kid's name the first time you met. Now, you don't know what to call them. You don't know what's right. Have you ever learned someone's name and to pronounce it wrong? And then you're like, I know it's wrong, but shit, I don't know how to say it correctly. And then you're like in that spot like, oh no, oh no, I know this is wrong but I know it's similar. Oh, no. And then you say, oh, hello, darling. And you use pet names because you can't. 
every gym class I, I there's one kid. Know. I still don't know how to say it. But now you've been friends long enough you can't ask. Yeah. Yeah, it's awkward. I get it. <laughs> there's people at work that I've been working with for like three plus years that I don't know their names. Yeah, yeah, it's awkward. But they know me and they know McCray's name. Retroactive interference is when new capitalized info information prevents you from recalling old capitalized info. For instance, you can't remember your friend of 10 years, 10 plus years, last name, pre-marriage. I can't remember Brittany's name, pre-marriage. Right now she's Brittany Hobb, but like, I can't remember what her maiden name is. And I knew her for four years before she got married. And I can't remember it. Cross off observational learning. Absolute threshold. I even had her in my phone for like three years after she got married as her maiden name and I still can't remember it. Absolute threshold. The best capitalized underlined a human has ever done something this is like hearing smelling tasting and seeing okay Remember when I was teaching you this? This is the guy who stood on a mountain and saw, like, six miles away a candle on the top of another mountain or some crazy shit. Like, this is, like, your Guinness Book of World Records stuff. Okay, we don't need Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. Shoot me in the face. But we are going to make a transduction, though. Okay, it's when your body... converts an outside stimulus parentheses light sound turn off your phone Dennis I'm sorry well that you should have been a better grown up and turn it off before you came in do it now Dennis it's rude into a neural impulse that your brain can actually process. And of course, our sensory organs that do this are bacillar membrane, taste buds, and retina. Cross off dependent variable, we've already done it, and we're going to write difference threshold. It is the amount of stimulation. You, and I'm writing it, capital underline, you, a person, not all of humanity. can perceive sound touch taste and sight varies for each person and is anyone here really good at hearing like have really good hearing no one like you can't hear like different pitches and if you're a musician you should have good hearing no one in this room has any talent I mean, got it I, can just hear I don't know how other people hear, so I can't hear has anyone ever said you have really good hearing or you can yeah. hear things other people can't yeah. congratulations Potter you've not been told 
Anyone here can see things really well? Like you see things other people don't? Is anyone in the room? Am I talking to myself? There you go. Thank you, Zoe. Anyone here can taste things? I'm a taster. I can pull out all the flavor profiles in wine. Pretty much nothing else. But wine I got, thank you, with a lot of practice comes skill. That anyone here really good at like sensations, like shirts and stuff bother you if they're like kind of scratchy and stuff. Okay, so everyone here, some things you're really good at, some things you really can't notice. It's that's your difference threshold, and it's individual for every single person. I would love to be a sommelier, but unfortunately, I have a real job which pays so well that it would. Teaching? No, bartending. <laughs> I wish teaching would really be my favorite thing in the world. If I could do it with a glass of wine in my hand, I'd be a much happier teacher. I don't know how much better my instruction would be after like six period, but I'd be happy. I would love to be a sommelier, however, it's not going to happen for me. Algorithms are problems, problem solving. By following a formula. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. No, I've met a bunch of sommeliers and some like like some grand sommeliers which are like super legit. Like there's only five women's uh, grand sommeliers in the world, and I've met one, and she was really cool. What a bomb check! And like I could do what she does. I could. But here I am. They spit wine though, right? Yes, because they can't be hammered all the time, Dennis. When a person cannot, in caps, functional fixedness is when a person cannot use an item in a different situation, in a different way than it was meant to. To be used. You need a hammer. Right. Use a stapler. If you couldn't come up with a solution for no hammer. You suffer from functional fixedness. Left brain versus right, left is linear language and logic, right is creative, creativity, music, and spatial awareness. We're getting curve, hell no, I'm not doing that shit again. We're gonna do neurotransmitters here. Alright, this is it. Are you ready? We're so close. ACH. I'm filling up this whole area, by the way, down here. It will be full. Excites. It's about your muscles. Learning. And memory. Is what this controls. Too much. Muscle spasms. Too little. Alzheimer's. Dopamine. It's an inhibitor. Mood. Emotions. And arousal are what they control. Too much. Schizophrenia. little 
Parkinson's. Serotonin. About uh, five total. I'm going to go on this side in a sec. Inhibitors. Mood regulation. Hunger. Sleep. Too much. Hallucinogen. Hallucinations, not hallucinogens. Hallucinogens cause hallucinations. I'm so sorry. I'm over this. Too little. Depression. All right, on this side, I have endorphins. We are so close. I'm so over this. Inhibitors. They are pain control. Stress reduction. Too much. Artificial highs. Highs. Too little. Addiction to opiates. You're going, well, no, you're going to tab an opiate and you're going to be like, damn. And then you're never going to stop taking it. Neoprephrine is going to excite. It's excitatory. It excites. And it's arousal. Neoprephrine. Slash alert. Alertness. And mood. Elevation. It's alertness. Too much is anxiety. Too little depression. Yes. Alertness. Uh, excitatory blocks. Uh, excitatory gets it to pump faster. The receptor. I'm done. Uh-uh. We're great. P exam. We're going to go over it. But Okay. Um, I don't want to talk to you, and I definitely don't want to hear from you. I need a long time. Can we agree? You're welcome, by the way.